Can you introduce the forceps and tell us about how they were developed? So the forceps are instruments that most people will be familiar with. They're used to deliver babies when the baby is presenting by the head, but labour has become obstructed. And they look a little bit like some salad servers. They're metal blades that fit around the head of the baby um, and can be used once the cervix is fully dilated. And about one in every eight women in the UK have an as assisted vaginal birth. So they are delivered either using the forceps or an instrument called um, a von Tuse, which is like a suction cap on the baby's head. Now, it's really important to remember right from the start that childbirth is usually very, very safe um, and it does happen spontaneously with very few problems. And the eight million people that we have on the earth are a testimony to that, um, that fact. We do know that when labour is left to itself, when it has become obstructed, um, and if we don't intervene, that the baby will die, unfortunately, and eventually the mother will die if we're not able to deliver the baby. Um, often that can take a long time. It's often because of bleeding or infection. Um, and that was particularly common in the Middle Ages and um, where intervention wasn't available. Do the forceps have any particularly interesting or surprising physical features? The forceps are the best known of the Chamberlain instruments and modified versions of those are still used today. So you will see um, forceps called the Wrigley's forceps quite commonly um, in a separate practice, certainly in the UK and in Europe. Um, and they will look very familiar to these historic examples that you can see on the screen. We know that there was quite a lot of variation in different types of the forceps. And when you look at forceps that were um, designed across um, the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, there is a, a range in um, a, a range of variation in those um, forceps. The ways that they differ, um, so some of them are fenestrated or not. So they have this window in the blade um, that you can see in the top. Um, picture here on the screen. Some of them um, didn't have that window, they were solid blades, um, but as time went on most of them were fenestrated and we know that the advantage of that is it spreads some of the pressure across the baby's head. Some very early forceps were hinged in the middle and we can see in the original Chamberlain instruments that you can see um, in the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists that very early versions had a hinge um, and, and that adapted as time moved on. And when William Smelly um, developed his version of the forceps, he used something called the English lock, which is still used in forceps design today. The other ways that forceps developed is um, change in the length of the handle. So some of them were quite short and some of them were much longer. And that depended on the situation that you could use it in and it depended on the way in which you use those forceps. Do the forceps require practitioners to develop specific skills or competencies to use them effectively? We know that in the forceps there is a huge need for skill. So the way that the forceps work is they mimic or they substitute what happens in normal labour. So part of that is that they slightly compress the baby's head and make it easier for it to pass through um, the birth canal for the baby to be delivered. They do provide traction, so as the practitioner pulls, um, the mother pushes and that helps to deliver the baby. And they can also help with rotation. So in normal labour, the baby's head will um, perform a series of manoeuvres to navigate through the birth canal. And the forceps can mimic that navigation and that rotation um, through to delivery. We know that skill is really important when it comes to using um, the, the forceps. So in 1702, James Douglas talked about being sent for by a midwife um, to deliver a woman in labour. And he started to apply the forceps, but he couldn't fasten them properly. He could he always blamed the instrument rather than himself. Um, but after three quarters of an hour of trying, he wasn't able to deliver the baby and had to leave the woman undelivered. What do the forceps tell us about medicine and medical ethics? 
So what do the forceps tell us about medicine? So we know that there is a really strong motivation um, to improve patient care. And that's a, a really big driver when it comes to innovation. Um, before the Chamberlain family developed these instruments, women were dying in childbirth. They were dying because we couldn't deliver babies. And so thinking differently was really important to improve the care for those women. And it also gave the Chamberlain family a competitive advantage, a financial advantage over their competitors um, because they were able to do something that their um, colleagues couldn't. We know that skills development is really essential for complex tasks and using the forceps is a very complex task. And as part of my research, I looked at how teaching impacts on that skills knowledge transmission. And I found that small group teaching and one to one was particularly important um, alongside hands on practice for developing clinical skills knowledge. So we need to think about what if ethical issues arise as a result of using the forceps. Part of what we need to think about is the balance of maternal rights versus fetal rights. And one of the things that has happened um, over the last 50 years particularly is that the, the advantages of things for um, fetal well-being have been conflated with the advantage of them for maternal well-being. So you often find that the advantages of something are actually advantages to the fetus rather than necessarily the mother. So we do have to think about that balance of maternal rights and fetal rights. Informed decision making and informed choice is also really important when we are thinking about um, using something like the forceps because the decision to make them is being made during childbirth. Um, often when someone has been in labour for a really long time, they are probably in pain. They are probably very tired, um, probably also quite scared. And so sometimes some of the language we use means that what we're asking may be not understood clearly. And we've got to think about that informed choice. And are we really gaining informed choice for them? Are we really asking women what they want? Or are we giving them enough information to gain compliance for them so that they go along with what we recommend? And part of that informed choice is thinking about the unintended consequences of forceps delivery. So we know that if, if we leave um, a woman undelivered, if she's got an obstructed labour, that eventually the baby will die and the mother will die, potentially. Um, but we also need to think about um, the method of delivery. And certainly in, in modern obstetric practice, we have alternatives. And so we do have to think about really spelling out those alternatives to women and really giving them good, clear information that's free of jargon so that they can make the appropriate decision for themselves.